but I just couldn't resist the pun on the year 2020. Uh, Happy New Year to you all, and uh, all the best for this year. So, 2020 in 2020. The first 2020 uh, refers to vision. So if you've got 2020 vision, you've got very good vision. I must admit, it's a phrase that I've known for years, but I've no idea what it meant, so I had to Google it. And the first 20 refers to 20 feet. Um, it's, if you, the eye chart is known as the Snellen eye chart, and it's placed at a position of 20 feet. Uh, so it's all set up for vision at 20 feet. If you have 20-20 vision, then at 20 feet, you can see what a normal person can see at 20 feet. If you have, say, 20-40 vision, then you need to stand at 20 feet to see what a person can normally see at 40 feet. So you will be considered slightly short-sighted. If you have 2015 vision, then you can see at 20 feet what a normal person can see at 15 feet. So your vision is better than normal. Apparently birds of prey have quite significantly improved vision. And I think somewhere they said it's something like 26 vision. So not only is the meeting spiritual, but it's educational. <laughs> Every day is a school day. And uh, just in case you think, well, you know, the first Sunday of the new year, I've just shoehorned this in as a title um, because it conveniently fits. Um, no, I haven't. It actually does fit with what I'm about to say. So if we go to the next slide, this comes from 2 Peter 1, verse 9. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind. So Peter is talking about a group of people, the whoever. He then talks about having something or not having something and equating them with nearsighted and blind people. So the talk is all about vision, but obviously it's not about physical vision, it's about spiritual vision. So Peter here is writing to a group of people, and obviously you have to work out who the group of people are that he's talking about to make sense of this verse and the surrounding verses. So we go to the next slide, and Peter's opening words in his second letter are these. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. So Peter is writing to believers, to those who have the same faith as he has. Um, as has been mentioned in another talk, I think Brian might have done it, but this is exactly the same faith. You have exactly the same faith. I have exactly the same faith as Peter had. There is no difference. There's difference to the extent it gets used in an individual's life, but there is no difference in what we have. Peter, Paul, us all have the same faith. So Peter here, right from the offset, is addressing Christians. So if we go to the next slide, we can fill in the whoever. But whoever, i.e. Christians, does not have whatever he's talking about, is nearsighted and blind. So he's talking about a group of Christians who fall into the category of being nearsighted or blind. Neither of which I would say is a great place to be. But it's something that we as Christians have to be aware of. Do we fall into the category of nearsighted or blind? Because it's quite obvious from what Peter says in these verses of 2 Peter 1 that there are Christians who fall into the category of blind or nearsighted. 
we go back to 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, let's try and put all of this into context. In 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, we read what I think are some of the most amazing verses in the whole of the New Testament. His, God's divine power, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, his glory and goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. According to what Peter says here, God, his divine power, has given us as believers every single thing we need for a life of godliness. There's no exception to that, as far as I can make out. God has provided everything we need to live a godly life. Whatever we need in this life, whatever we require, whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, he provides everything necessary, with no exception. And then it goes on to talk about the fact that he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that we, through these promises, may participate in the divine nature. That in itself is quite a staggering statement to say that we as believers can participate in the divine nature. All that God is, we can partake of. That is colossal, that is immense in its significance. But it shows the heart of God for us, his children, that he wants us to partake in all that he is about. And as it says right at the very beginning there, he has given us everything that is necessary to make that happen. I think, as I said, this, these are verses are, are very tremendous verses because they can elevate a human being from just being human to the divine state. It's not that we have divinity within ourselves, it's divinity that's imparted to us, it's given to us, it's worked within us, it empowers us, it affects us, it indwells us, and trying to get your head around these things is complicated. But this is what Peter says, and there are verses by the Apostle Paul that speak of the same thing, Christ in us the hope of glory which is one of Fran's verses and the mystery of godliness Christ in us but here Peter I think is referencing this type of aspect and he continues next slide Peter continues in 2 Peter 1, 5 to 7, for this very reason, and the, the very reason mentioned is the fact that we've escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Through the work of God, we have escaped the corruption in the world. I think Peter and Paul in the letter to Colossians sort of gets to this when he says that we've been rescued from the dominion of the darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his son, which also equates to the kingdom of light. We've been rescued from darkness and brought into the glorious light of God. And Peter goes on, he says, make every effort to add to your faith. So you have the faith, but then Peter says, you've got to add to your faith. You add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. So there are a list of things here that Peter says that we should make every effort 
to add to our faith these qualities. So if we look at these qualities sort of one by one, the first one, if we go to the next slide. So we look at goodness. Well, what is goodness? Go to the next slide. This is the way it sort of gets used. The Greek word gets used in the New Testament. It can mean intrinsic eminence, moral goodness, virtue, excellence, praise. Strong's just, uh, defines it as manliness, valor, that is excellence, intrinsic or attributed, praise, virtue. So it covers quite a few things. But you get the feel of this, that this is about, these are excellent qualities. This is an excellence to have. And Peter says this is something you should add to your life. Think of yourself in excellent terms. Think of yourself in virtuous terms. Add to yourself virtue, moral excellence. If you, it's quite interesting actually, this word gets used, uh, Peter says it's something that we should add to our faith, but it's actually something that occurs earlier on in 2 Peter 1. So we go to the next slide. Um, 2 Peter 1.3 says, His, God's divine power, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Well, the word goodness there is exactly the same word in the Greek, but Peter says that we should add to our faith. To me, I sort of looked at it and think, well, this is a, a divine quality, and God wants us to have that divine quality ourselves. He wants us to add this to our lives. And interestingly, this word gets used elsewhere. If you look at 1 Peter 2.9, which is the next slide, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a special people for God's own possession, so you may proclaim the excellencies the wonderful deeds and virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. So the word that gets translated goodness in 2 Peter 1 is this word that gets, the way the Amplified has, uh, has defined it as excellencies, the wonderful deeds and virtues and perfections. And so Peter is saying to us that that's what we should add to our life. We should in a sense, attain to the excellence of life, all that God is about. He wants us to be excellent. He wants us to have virtue. And to me, that's a sort of, that's a, a raising of the level, you know, uh, of our expectations to be, to be better, to be greater, to be higher. But it's what God wants us to be. It's sort of the elevation that God wants us to have of our own selves. It is a tremendous thing. Here we go to the next slide. The next thing that Peter mentions is knowledge. The word uh, knowledge here is really about facts. It's about information. There's another Greek word for knowledge which gets used three other times in this chapter, which is more about a, a depth of knowledge, depth of relationship, a, a real knowing something in an intimate way. Whereas the word for knowledge here in the Greek is about facts, it's about information. And to me that explains why it's important to know the Bible, because the Bible is the facts, it's the information about God. And Peter says that's a good thing to add to your faith, add to your faith knowledge. The next slide, Peter says you add self-control, add self-control to your faith. We as a people should be self-controlled. It's also seen as a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. But here Peter says it's a good thing to add to your faith, add self-control. Next slide. To self-control, Peter says, add perseverance. Again, 
this is sort of quite a biggish word in the Greek, but if we look at the next slide, we get a, an idea of what Peter's trying to get at here. It's a steadfastness. It's the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. Strong's defines it as cheerful or hopeful endurance, a constancy, enduring, patience, patient continuance. Within this is implied the sort of stickability, sticking with the faith, sticking with your faith in the in God, in the Lord. No matter what happens, keep with it, keep on, persevere, be steadfast. Stick with it through thick and thin. You go to the next slide. The next thing Peter mentions is godliness. And this in a, is sort of perhaps a, a difficult word to perhaps understand, but Peter says it's something that we should add to our faith. And to me, is what Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.16 that I think sort of gives, a bit of a, gives us a bit of understanding what Peter's trying to get at when he talks about godliness. So if we go to the next slide, this is Paul writing in 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So Paul here says, the mystery of godliness is a great thing. And there's something very significant about godliness from a New Testament perspective. And then Paul goes on to say, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, but here it is talking about what godliness equates to. And it's this very real sense that God can make his home in human flesh. That's what he did with Jesus Christ. He made himself at home in Jesus. But from other verses in the Bible, this thought comes across that God makes his home in us too. You know, there are many, many verses that talk about Christ in us. And there are verses that talk about the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And there are verses that talk about God the Father making his home in us. So you have the Trinity making their home within the human beings. And that, in a sense, equates with what Peter says when he says, talks about partaking of the divine nature. In a sense, I see it as sort of God has made his home in us. We are spiritually transformed people. But there has to be manifestation of that impact within our souls, our wills, our bodies. And I think, what God wants to do is transform from the inside out, us totally, us completely. It's sort of what Paul said when he said, no longer do I live, but Christ lives in me. He could sort of almost say, I'm divinity expressing itself through me. It's a difficult concept to get your head round. But this is what Peter's talking about. It's backed up by other scriptures from Paul and from Jesus himself. But this, in a sense, is godliness. The fact that God can be manifest within mortal flesh. God makes his home within us. The Trinity is at home within us. Which I think if we got our heads around that would probably blow our mind, really. It's absolutely awesome. Now we go to the next slide. Peter says to godliness, you must add mutual affection. Brotherly love, I think it sort of says in other translations. You know, consideration for people, care for people, looking after people, that concern... And then Peter says to mutual affection, add, which is probably the greatest of all things to add here, I suppose, but love, this agape love. So 
If we go to the next slide, Peter, if we take this verse that we originally started with, but whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, and now fill in what the whoever is and whatever the them is, you then get this, but whoever, but if Christians do not have these, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection and love, then they are nearsighted and blind. In a verse that I think occurs slightly prior to this, Peter talks about the fact that Christians who are in this situation don't bear fruit, they're unproductive. They are ineffective. You could almost say, well, they're pretty useless. Not a great place to be. But here Peter is saying Christians can be useless. They can be blind. They can be nearsighted. Because they don't have these things manifesting in their lives. It's interesting that Peter uses two phrases really. He uses the phrase nearsighted and he uses the phrase blind. I would have said a, a nearsighted person isn't a blind person and vice versa. Why is he using two phrases that I would have thought are mutually exclusive? But maybe he's trying to get at the point that Christians who don't have these aspects to their lives and add to their faith these aspects of their lives. To start with the nearsighted, well the nearsightedness is not to do with physical vision, as I said, it's to do with spiritual vision. But a nearsighted Christian can only see sort of what's in front of them or just a, you know, a few feet in front. But what God is looking for is for Christians who are spiritually able to see beyond the current situation further. The current situation may be difficult and challenging, but he doesn't want us to be nearsighted. He wants to see the potential that can exist beyond the current circumstances, seeing spiritually into the distance. But many Christians, according to Peter, are nearsighted, they're short-sighted. They can only see their current situation. They go into panic mode. So it throws them into despair. Whereas what Peter wants is people who can see further than their current situation and can see the possibilities and the potential and the capability of God, and the, the capability of all that the divine nature is to go through the situation, come out the other side stronger, more powerful, more godly, more of who God wants us to be. But I think Peter is seeing Christians as sort of, they can only see their immediate situation, go into complete meltdown and have no capability of seeing spiritually into the distance, into the future. The fact that Peter says Christians can be nearsighted means that there are nearsighted Christians. It's a simple fact. And then he talks about the blind, a blind Christian. Well, to me, a blind Christian is somebody who can't see anything. Everything is dark. You can't see a thing. And when we read passages that say God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light, to me a blind Christian who is somebody who is in the kingdom of light and everything around them is glorious and wonderful and amazing and staggering and yet they're blind. So all they see is darkness. The potential, the possibilities are completely lost on them because they're blind. In a sense, that's a, probably a dreadful state to be in, to be a blind Christian, a spiritually blind Christian. To have all the possibilities and potentials of what God can offer, what he's about, what he has done, and to not see it, 
is an absolute travesty. And yet Peter says, there are blind Christians. It's a challenging passage, really, because I looked when I was reading this, and I think, well, you know, am I a nearsighted Christian? Am I a blind Christian? And you challenge yourself, and you look at these virtues and uh, things that he's mentioned, and you think, well, am I doing this? Am I adding these things to my faith so that I'm not nearsighted and blind, so that I have spiritual, spiritually correct vision? There we go, the next slide. This is 2 Peter 1, 9 and 10. So it's slightly uh, added a few, added a verse, I think, onto the one I was looking at. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. These blind and nearsighted people also, not only are they sort of blind, not only are they nearsighted, but they've forgotten that their past life has been done away with, that they are a new creation. To me, it sort of speaks of the past, their past sort of life impacting their current life and causing them to be um, ineffective and unproductive. I think what Peter is trying to show here is that as Christians, our past has been done away with. We are a new creation in Christ. The old has gone, the new has come. But I think Peter envisages people here who are stuck with their old nature hanging around, interfering with their life, disrupting it, causing them chaos and problems. And they haven't realized, look, God through Jesus Christ has dealt with the past. Now you can live in the present, move on into the future. The past has been dealt with. Don't let it shackle you, chain you, hinder you, hamper you. It's been done. It's been dealt with. And Peter continues, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. He's talking about confirming your calling. And he's talking about if you do the things that he's mentioned, then you will never stumble. Well, the fact that he says you won't stumble means that it is possible to stumble. So he's talking about a group of Christians, you know, he's in various ways. He's talking about blind Christians. He's talking about nearsighted Christians. He's talking about Christians who don't realize their past sins have been cleansed, purified. The past is behind them. They can move on into the future. He's talking about Christians who can stumble, who can fall, who can falter. But he said if you add to their faith the things that have been mentioned, then you will not fall, you will not be nearsighted, you will not be blind, you will not be unproductive, you will not be unfruitful. And I would think that all of us for 2020 would want to be fruitful, productive, effective. We don't want to stumble, we don't want to be blind, we don't want to be nearsighted. We want to be all that God wants us to be. So here we go to the next slide. And so just to finish, what will you add to your faith in 2020 to give you clearer vision? What will I add to my faith? And there are the things there mentioned. Maybe, you know, good New Year's resolution. Take one of them and think, right, I'll add that to my life. Because it will make me more productive as a Christian. It will stop me falling. It will stop me being short-sighted. You know, maybe it's self-controlled. Maybe you have to add to your faith knowledge. You need to read the Word of God more to see what he says about things. Maybe you need to add affection and love. But the fact that Peter says that these are good things to add to our faith makes me think, well, yeah, maybe we should take these things seriously and think about adding to our faith what Peter talks about so that we can see clearly, so that we can have 2020 spiritual vision in the year 2020. Amen.